So welcome to the August Natural Areas Association webinar. Uh, I'm Maura McGinty Kloss. I am the Programs and Communications Manager, and I'm delighted that you're joining us today. The purpose of NAA webinars is not just to convey in information, but to engage natural areas professionals on topics of interest that highlight emerging science, methodologies, and best practices. I encourage you to participate in this webinar by asking questions, comments, and using the chat function for that purpose. We'll address as many questions as we can during the Q&A at the end of this. Um, and also, I'd like to tell you that if there's a topic of interest and you'd like to see a webinar on it, just let us know. Email us at info at naturalareas.org. So I'd like to tell you just a little bit more about the Natural Areas Association if you're new to us. We serve those who are dedicated to the management and restoration of biologically important natural areas in North America. Protecting nature requires reliable science to inform practices on the ground and a network of stewards who work tirelessly to protect, manage, and restore land and water biodiversity. NAA is an engaged community of peers and colleagues who become a resource to each other so that you can share methodologies, ideas, practices, sciences, and advances. For over 40 years, we've been sharing this information through our Natural Areas Journal, and I'd like to let you know that the July issue is now available through our Steward in Action workshops, and we're excited to be having our first in-person uh, workshop again in September in Virginia, and State Natural Areas Program Roundtables. And our next roundtable is November 17th, and we'll be actually calling on all of you from state programs to share with us the progress, the successes, the challenges, and the areas where you just might need a little help. So we hope you'll put that on your calendar as well. And then of course, we have our Natural Areas Conference, and I'll talk about that in a minute. So if you're not a member of the NAA, we hope you'll consider joining. If you are participating, you, you paid to participate today. Uh, an annual membership is just $79. So if you even attend three webinars, you've already paid for your membership. So we just want to, to remind you that you will have a seven day trial as a part of paying for your participation today. That will give you access to the archive and to the recording. And we hope you'll consider joining at that time. If you do, it will only be for $50. We'll apply the 29 you paid today to your membership. And this is just a little review of what you get when you're a member. So I mentioned earlier our 2021 Natural Areas Conference. We are going to go virtual again this year just to be on the safe side. Uh, it is a one day virtual event and it is life from the ashes exploring the impact of prescribed natural fire on insects and other invertebrates. So we hope that you'll join us. We have a wide cross section of speakers. You can learn more on our, at our website at www.naturalareas.org. And we do have early bird rates in effect through September 8th. We also have a November webinar planned using informed plant selection to restore pollinators and songbirds in human dominated landscapes. And we hope you'll consider putting that on your calendar and joining us for that as well. So now I want to introduce our uh, speaker for today. So Todd Esk is a research ecologist in the US Geological Survey Western Ecological Research Center in Boulder City, Nevada. He acquired his education at Prescott College, Colorado State University, and the University of Nevada, Reno. As an ARIDS research ecologist, he conducts field and laboratory experiments responding to natural resource issues and assists managers in accordance with the USGS Wildlife Invasive Species and Energy and Wildlife Programs. His study includes Southwestern United States and Northern Mexico and his multi-scale research program i.e. genetics through ecosystems, focuses in a variety of specialty areas such as bioecochemistry, physiology, epidemiology, demographics, landscape genetics, predator and prey relationships, habitat quality, fire and other disturbances and habitat restoration. He collaborates with the government, private public service organizations and he supports graduate student research and serves on several student committees. And so at this point in time, Todd, I will turn it over to you so you can take over screen sharing. So uh, I want to thank the Natural Areas Association for inviting me to give this talk today. Uh, this is a paper that we worked on uh, actually for years uh, as, a, as a review article. And um, uh, this was at the request of 
uh, the uh, native plant um, production and uh, research uh, group in uh, the BLM in California to start with and in Nevada. And so um, they asked us to work on priority species list to restore desert tortoise habitat to begin with. And uh, when we just about got done with that work, um, they asked us to expand the project to include pollinators. And so uh, I have to admit right up front, I'm a little bit of an imposter here. First of all, um, I, I'm really a, a desert tortoise biologist, uh, an arid lands ecologist, uh, but not a specialist on pollinators, um, or for that matter, for restoration, for which uh, my co-author, uh, Leslie DeFalco, is really the, uh, the lead on the restoration aspects of this work, and I'm supposed to bring in the tortoise part. But nevertheless, here we are. Um, the reasons why we worked on this priority species list is the, the need for science-based evidence to select plant materials in the Mojave Desert. And um, we selected the criteria based on broad habitat needs from the literature, uh, starting out with the tortoise list, and then uh, doing a search on those plants for what their pollinators um, and other associated uh, invertebrates might be. And then uh, in the end of this talk, we'll talk about um, how the PSL informs um, a spatially explicit seed menus and, um, and other spatial tools that the um, managers can use. We have a lot of partners and collaborators that supported this work and uh, just a, a nod to all those folks and uh, many different groups across the desert. And uh, to talk about why we need to have uh, restoration work with with plants that will be successful. Uh, there are a lot of causes of, de of, uh, of disturbances in the desert. And um, we've been working with uh, fire in the desert for probably about the last 40 years with the, about 40 years was a, a huge increase in moisture um, con in contrast to today, uh, the wettest time on record. And at that time, uh, native grasses, uh, which were all over the desert at the time already, they sort of exploded and we started having these widespread desert, um, desert fires that can be carried by these grasses and cover uh, millions of acres. Uh, not, not news at this point in the, in the game. Uh, we, we, more recently, um, and since the 70s, there's been actually 50 years, uh, a lot of activity from OHV enthusiasts in the desert and other types of recreation, wheeled recreation in the desert. Um, this can cause damage in a lot of areas uh, that uh, require um, restoration. And in fact, I'm working uh, right now with uh, Barstow, California, BLM, and we have right now on our map thousands of roadheads that they're trying to close. And that is in itself a challenge and a talk in itself. Uh, only in the last two decades, there's been the energy development boom. Uh, this is a scene across um, an area that was formerly very high quality desert tortoise habitat. And as you can see now, there's, there's very little lift of that habitat. We do a lot of work on what does that mean to the desert tortoise in the large landscape scale, such as the lower left-hand map uh, showing the climate uh, change velocity, which is of course the 400-pound uh, the gorilla in the room uh, with climate change and just what will we do when, even if we can get these plants growing, how will we respond to the likely change across the landscape as we deal with um, moving climate envelopes? So a little bit more about how we responded to the fires when they first started coming along. Uh, desert managers responded with disturbances with a lot of different methods. Uh, broadcast seeding, seed coating, pitting, harrowing, drilling. I won't go through all of them. Uh, there's a lot longer list than that that folks have tried to do. However, without the proper measures of success, the methods were sometimes um, used ineffectively. Uh, failed methods were repeated. For example, um, they're still using seed balls in some parts of the desert um, where it's it just not adapted for that kind of work because we don't have the moisture to, to make the dynamics work with the seed balls. That's been going on since the 30s and 40s in the arid Southwest. And it was published in 1963 or four that they, um, they don't really work. So this is one example. Uh, restoration progress has been very slow, but it is rapidly picking up now with this programs that we're going to talk about today. Um, not only that, but the practitioner has found that um, there was insufficient seed and plant materials, appropriate ones, for re uh, revegetating large disturbances, again, talking about uh, millions of acres at a time. Guidance was unavailable on how far to source the seeds from, and um, the cultivars and other seed sources were used from outside the ecoregion or without provenance at all. And finally, uh, we have even recently, um, well, 10 years ago maybe, uh, 
we would hear stories of folks going to these seed buys where there's an auction and the person that went with the biggest fistful of money came back with all the seeds. And that could be your coworker in the next resource area, but that's how the game went back then. It was kind of like, it was the wild west back then, but um, programs like the National Seed Strategy have worked to stabilize the environment, to help with communication and provide a framework to identify the seed needs uh, for and uh, stability and funding to do research and develop tools for the managers and promote communication. So this has been a huge boom to the uh, community of restorationists to be able to have this available to us. The program that we are working in was designed, was envisioned by uh, Christina Lund and Fred Edwards, who's not the US Fish and Wildlife Service, both of them were at BLM then, and they had envisioned us starting with uh, the, the left-hand side of the page, there's a priority plant species list. This was supposed to be the first product to come out. It took a little longer and that's the way things work sometimes. But that was informed somewhat by some of the experimental research restoration networks that are available out in the desert right now, uh, led by uh, Leslie DeFalco and other folks in other institutions. Um, so the uh, priority species plant list has subsequently uh, informed uh, uh, um, provisional seed transfer zones, as well as uh, informed the work to establish um, empirical seed transfer zones uh, with the use of the common garden network and uh, landscape genetic work. And all of these um, result in other tools for the managers we'll talk about at the end of the talk. Why the desert tortoise uh, was, um, was selected. Uh, well, I got to tell you right up front that this was much to the chagrin of the, the lead botanists in the Southwest. Uh, the desert tortoise does glean a lot of the resources for research and conservation in the Southwestern US because it is a threatened species under the Endangered Species Act. It's also uh, very widespread in the Mojave Desert, essentially covering the entire footprint, at least at the boundaries of the Mojave Desert here in Utah, Arizona, Nevada, and California. All of the low desert valleys, the bottoms of the valleys up into the, the, uh, the, the slopes and the foothills, and even into the, some of the rocky uh, passes. At this point, we are aware that that occurs. And um, the tortoise is an umbrella species because of its protection. Uh, a lot of the landscape um, can be protected for other species in the area. Desert tortoise populations have been in decline for some time for a variety of reasons. But uh, one of the big reasons is because of habitat declines. So in the south, in the lower um, left corner here shows a picture of what we call a bromus desert, uh, brome grass, um, a, a Eurasian plant that is uh, taken over a lot of areas in the west, and its its um, cousin is cheatgrass up in the Great Basin Desert. You've heard probably a lot more about that in for the last thirty years. Um, these areas, once they burn, can become a bromus desert. And uh, subsequent burns, uh, this, this location probably burned three or four times. On the first burn, it doesn't look quite that bad, but then it is prone to fire because of the continuity of, the, of this fine fuel. And it lends itself to burning uh, um, every time there's an, uh, an ignition source uh, and there's decent rain in the winter. Uh, the red brome is bad for the diet of desert tortoises. Um, adult tortoises can get impacted from it. Um, and we're just beginning, um, there's a talk going on today at the Turtle Survivor Alliance of work that we did on the microbiome of the desert tortoise and how it might be affected, uh, the gut microbiome, the microflora in the, uh, uh, in the stomach of the tortoises and the intestines uh, uh, by um, the um, bromus grasses in the diet. And so we've done experiments to understand that, but we have shown that small tortoises eating this uh, essentially are filtered out of the system because uh, of the damage it causes. It's very low nutrition as well as potential damage to the uh, interior of the tortoise and um, creating a demographic filter. And then we don't have to wonder so much why we are not seeing the populations grow. So moving on, uh, to emphasize the priority species list is not um, a prioritizing the species like the top one being the most uh, important species, but rather all of the species on the list are prioritized. And that was an important distinction to make. Uh, and such that uh, essentially all the tortoises in this photo, um, all of the flowers in this photograph are in the tortoise diet. The, the other reason why the tortoise is an excellent uh, 
organism as an umbrella species for this project is that um, they're a very broad generalist in their diets. And so they essentially sam sample everything that's out there, including annuals and perennials, as well as lots of other things that are out there. But in the end, about 80% of the uh, diet ends up being uh, annual um, forbs and uh, short life perennials. So we had uh, five criteria uh, under which uh, plants could be part of the priority species list. And the first one was that would promote tortoise habitat by, um, by increasing those species, it would be better in the habitat for the desert tortoise. As we mentioned, they're widespread. Um, the data that we had to, to draw from on this were essentially all of the diet studies that have been done on desert tortoises. There were 15 of those spreading across the desert from number one on the left there, out of the desert tortoise natural area in the West Mojave, uh, down number four, down in the bottom, uh, is Joshua Tree National Park. Across the desert, in the middle of the desert, there's a cluster there, seven, eight, nine. Uh, that's in the Las Vegas area, greater Las Vegas area, and all the way up to St. George, Utah, but number 15, uh, where uh, one of my, uh, Leslie DeFalco and I uh, both worked on our master's degrees up there. And, um, and so we have a transit going across the desert to represent a pretty good um, representation of what plants uh, should be used in desert tortoise diets. And then the cover plants are covered uh, are from nine different sites. Uh, we had some 4,000 incidents of tortoises using cover uh, very recently, actually, uh, compared to the diet work. Um, we're, we're still collecting a lot of data on what plants tortoises are using on a daily basis. And uh, the squares on the map show where those are. And so they go from the West Mojave again up to the Northeast Mojave, not so much down in the South. Uh, one other aspect about this is that we used bite count data. Um, which is, I'll show a picture of that if it works. Um, basically, the mandibles of a desert tortoise biting, you know, one, two, three. And so we had an army of people counting bites to understand the relative importance of plants in the diet of desert tortoises. We also used a fecal analysis where you get their scats and can analyze them microhistologically and understand what species are in there, uh, or just making casual observations. This is a, a juvenile desert tortoise that is enthusiastically climbed up into a shrub, which is a pretty tenuous position for any tortoise to be in with all four feet off the ground in a globe mallow shrub, and it's eating the leaves. And bite counts consist of each time that mandible closes on a leaf, counting it. This only goes for less than a minute. and the tortoise succeeded in feeding for a minute and didn't fall out of the shrub, which was good because once they're on their backs, it's, it's even more tenuous. So next slide. Um, in the end, with counting bites across the desert and fecal analysis, we ended up with 201 plant taxa in the diets of desert tortoises that were found to be important at some level for them uh, to sustain themselves. So that was the basis that we started with. And then we had 49 plant uh, taxa all perennial shrubs except for um, the globe mallow, which you just saw the tortoise climbing in. And in this case, we have a picture of a creosote bush on the left, which is about a meter tall. Um, you can see the shadow that it casts is not a complete shadow, not deep shade, but, um, but nonetheless, very important to tortoises because these is essentially, um, this and the, uh, the white burr sage, which is in the right-hand picture uh, and shows a little bit better cover from the shade, we're in uh, more, more than 60% of the observations of desert tortoises use those shrubs. Both of them are also very important for uh, holding the soil together so that tortoises can burrow underground uh, during the heat of the day. The second criterion um, to be included in the list was that it was uh, these plants used were proven to sustain pollinators in some way. Uh, we simplified it here with hosting larva and providing nectar, but uh, the uses included uh, the nectar, pollen, uh, oils that could be mixed, uh, and waxes that could be mixed uh, in different uses by uh, a lot of times the bees, and then uh, either cover or nesting materials. I'm surprised when I go to photograph flowers how many times I find bees sleeping in those flowers. 
Um, this list I'm adding to for myself all the time. In fact, uh, yesterday I added this, the lower left-hand corner is a polyphemus moth, which I only knew from the Eastern US, but a friend of mine found one near Caliente, Nevada yesterday and a close-up of the eyes of that moth are right here. But then in, in putting that in there, I realized that in fact, that is not a pollinator um, because really they're just a predator of plants. Um, and I'm not even sure out West what plants they will feed on, but um, we had a big diversity of these species. Um, and it turned out that 80, almost 80% 80 of them were regular bees, what you would call regular, um, um, various native bees. Um, um, 60 percent, uh, 60 plus percent of the use was on was by butterflies of the plant species available. Uh, wasps and others were about 10 percent. Uh, flies and hummingbirds, uh, a really small percent, really. And then um, even beetles were included in that list. The third criterion for being included on the priority species list was that the species were widespread and abundant species. So by being desert tortoise food, they were generally widespread, although they will find rare things too. But for example, this um, uh, popcorn flower or um, Kenactis uh, uh, species, this is an unusual circumstance. You can see there are stumps out there of dead Joshua trees that actually burned. So under some circumstances, as the perennials are burned off in these desert fires, there can be a flush of native annuals for a year or two, but it eventually, usually the, um, the weedy grasses move in after these situations. But under these circumstances, this was a, a boon to um, photographers and uh, seed collectors if you happen to be in the area. The fourth criterion for being included in the uh, priority species list was um, that there were known methods for collection, propagation, and seed increase. Uh, to make it a, a strong candidate for the um, growers that we could, um, the BLM could uh, involve to increase the seed available, uh, which is part of the program that Judy Perkins runs out of BLM in California. And the fifth uh, and last criterion to improve was to improve ecological function in the area, including factors like habitat structure, soil stabilization to prevent a erosion, uh, increased water infiltration, uh, nucleate cycling, nutrient cycling and redistribution, and uh, microsites like nurse plants uh, to grow other plants and, um, and vertebrates and invertebrates and cover. So this is a pretty messy little slide, but um, it's an example of uh, a, a pretty a uh, hefty supplement that goes with the paper that we published. And, uh, and this is an excerpt for the plant um, globe mallow or Sphralsia ambigua. And so the primary topics for these were um, functional groups and bloom season, distribution across the Mojave, uh, which is easy to acquire in most places, but seemed like it'd be something that you'd want to have uh, for practitioners. Uh, the flower color and shape, which has something to do with what pollinators might be uh, involved. Um, documentation of pollinator use and tortoise use, um, propagation, production, and cultivation methods that are available um, in the literature at this time, and then the potential recoverability. And I feel like um, on, on this section, it was it made the bulk of this paper by, uh, by weight and, uh, and took the most time to work on. But I feel like it's just a um, sort of the tip of the iceberg with what is possible out there. Um, I'm finding a growing number of uh, websites, independently run websites that have the types, different pieces of this information. And uh, the BLM has actually been discussing very recently um, uh, making a, a live um, sort of uh, a website that um, could be added to um, so that it would be um, alive rather than just being set um, in the printed form. Uh, in the end, uh, there were 57 taxonomic groups because we lumped groups like the lysiums and things like that, uh, including 130 plant species that have been included uh, with uh, a fair amount of detail, all the detail that we could find for these species on these topics. And um, the work was further incorporated by a couple of tools that were created. Um, this is a customized seed menu, the, the newest tool, and it's still in general review at this time. And in this case, we um, merged um, species distribution models um, with um, information about the climate and from genetics work that we have. And this tool is set up to, uh, for the user to go in and either provide coordinates 
map clicks or shape files for locations in the Mojave Desert. And then um, you can sit, you can set a minimum habitat suitability, or you can just let the model uh, provide everything that lives in these areas that you've uh, identified. Um, this has to do with uh, thresholding in um, species distribution models. Um, and what that will do is um, by, by identifying those locations, it will identify all the species that live in those areas that you can select from. And the output is a, uh, a joint habitat map provided of the species that are available in that area. And then a lot of uh, specific characteristics for those species that can be used by the restoration practice practitioner. Uh, and this is what the interface looks like on the internet when you use it. This is not live and we're not gonna go there with that today, but um, thought you might wanna see that. And I think we've got that provided in another site. Um, on the lower, on the upper side here is more, a little bit more about that, um, the seed menu. But then there's one other product that we, uh, that created uh, Dan Shryock, who works with this and co-author. Uh, and with this, you can identify uh, where the seed sources might be, um, and then the project sites that you want to work on. And then you can find out what the climate distance, uh, the difference in the climate from where your project site is to where the seed sources are that you're thinking about are in order to understand um, the, the best um, going from just species, you can then start to zoom in on ecotypes or locally adapted species, which was the original intent of this whole idea. Um, this can also has a, a forecasting uh, component, which looks at future distributions for the species that are listed in the uh, program and um, thought that might be useful too, and probably um, a uh, rich area of discussion. So um, with that, we'll um, go to questions if you have some. Um, I want to thank you for your time. Thank you, Todd. We appreciate the presentation. It was very interesting. Um, so how will the web-based tools that incorporate the PSL account for climate change? Those, both of those tools have a component that looks at um, future climates, incorporated future climates, and how those will affect, based on the climate space occupied by the species now, where will those climate um, envelopes be in the future? So moving across the landscape, it accounts for moving across the landscape, um, which, um, so, I, to me, that begs the question, um, are we going to commit to um, investing seeding or growing plant materials in places that um, might have those species based on a model or not? I wonder how, what kind of enthusiasm there is for that kind of activity or discussion. Hopefully in the future, we get to those kind of questions. I think we're, in, I think, or maybe the future is now for those kind of questions. And are there efforts to understand how these priority species succeed in a changing climate? Yes, uh, the BLM program that they established and worked with us on uh, includes um, a common garden network that spreads across um, those maps that we saw. There's, there's 12 gardens across the Mojave Desert representing the, the climate available at this time from the hottest and driest to the wettest and coolest. And uh, the current experiments going on there uh, take samples of plants from across the desert in all the different environments and cross um, plant them in the different gardens to look at the plant performance, as well as um, attempting to match um, the, the genome of the plants with adaptive genes. So we can begin to understand which ecotypes have the greatest capacity to respond to climate change and where that might be. So I have one, is this PSL approach being taken to manage Sonora desert population of tortoises and pollinators? No, I would say no. Um, you could look at the species and see what's, what likely pollinators are there and things like that. Uh, the tools aren't designed for that part of the desert right now, but we do have a PSL that we were asked to write for the Sonoran desert. So in California, you get aspects of the Sonoran desert. The leads in California asked us to write the Sonoran a Sonoran desert priority species list. And when we when they sub, when they um, proposed that to the national leadership, they said, well, you can only do that if you do the whole Mojave, the whole Sonoran desert. So we do have uh, sitting in the wings a, another entire document that covers, uh, I don't even know off the top of my head, but um, it's a comparable number of species. And, um, and that one contrasts in that we also broadened the search to other wildlife uses, not just the desert tortoise and pollinators. 
Good, good. Well, I do want to remind everyone that this, uh, the full research, the article was published in the Natural Areas Journal. That's the cover that's on your screen right now. Uh, it is an open access article, and I did also put a link to the article in chat. So, um, Todd, thank you so much for joining us today. This was, was really, really interesting. Um, I'm sure people are going to enjoy reading the article more in depth. And thank you so much. Thanks for the opportunity to speak about it. Take care.